Dr. Amwiri. Check that. Yes. Okay, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Any questions on the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Public comments. No public comments. Committee chair reports. Russell Bills. Looks like light month for the uh, highway department. Uh, you said that last month. Yeah. All the projects are going very smoothly so far, and uh, which makes it a lighter month. Very good. Mr. Barron. Um, management, we're going to discuss a little bit on snow removal. I'm sure that'll be fun for everybody. Uh, other than that, I think it's mostly regular reports. can't think of anything else. Policy for the use of this room? Oh, that's right, yes. Uh, we need to get that done. Yeah. Well, we'll try. We'll see what, you know, there was a lot of questions from some of them. So we'll see if they come up with answers. Judicial? Judicial, just regular reports. Okay, Marvin Tax. At this point, all we have scheduled is the customary department head reports. Okay. Pretty soon you'll start working on the levy. Yes, sure will. Probably next month? Probably. Okay. Very good. Eric, you may report. Um, I coordinate preparations for Milford Fun Days. 
Uh, one thing that my office tries to do is uh, coordinate planning with the host of an outdoor event, especially this time of year, they become popular and uh, they are susceptible, especially to uh, severe weather. So we just talked with them, um, figure out what kind of population they were expecting, how long it would take to evacuate, how best we could serve them, and letting them know of any severe weather coming their way, so on and so forth. And we did all that, and because of that, I'm sure, we had great weather that weekend. So, planning for county fair, that ties into the tabletop exercise we had for outdoor event planning. Had a couple of fair representatives there, so that was good. And we've had numerous uh, different days throughout this month where we've had to uh, monitor the radar. Luckily, we have not sustained any severe weather damage. However, it's been possible. Uh, looking forward, on the 29th of June, excuse me, it says July. Tomorrow, I have a long-term recovery committee meeting that I have to attend. Uh, 3rd of July, monthly IEMA Starcom 21 radio drill. Uh, Independence Day, uh, there's numerous outdoor events, so I try to keep apprised of those going on for the same reason that I um, plan for Milton Fun Days. Uh, I'm going to attend a, a planning meeting for Iroquois County Fair where I meet with the people that run law enforcement and fire uh, rescue. Um, and we plan out what we need to do in case something goes back. Uh, Iroquois County Fair itself, I do plan on having a table out there as I have in years past. Um, which has been very helpful in coordinating with the uh, people that run that event for safety reasons. And also it gets EMA's presence out in the community. People are familiar, us, familiar with us when, when things actually happen. And like I said, late July I'm going to have the next hazard mitigation plan meeting. What I forgot to include uh, is that I will be working on updating the annual training exercise plan, something I submit to the state every year, um, countywide uh, trainings and exercises that we want held for the next three to five years. So, that's what you for. Any questions? You made a statement that the weather at the Milford Fun Days was really good. What's your definition of good weather? <laughs> definition of really good is not dangerous. As Mr. Barron's going to say, those of us that participated in the parade had set on a wet float. Yes. I apologize for the rain. Uh, I did not cause it, but you'll do better for the 4th of July. You know, I'll do my best. It's not looking good. Uh, but I will say, I was watching the radar and uh, was confident that there was no severe weather besides the rain. Right. There was a drizzle, but it made everything wet. Quite inconvenient. Yeah. Including our state's attorney. Dust control keeps it clean air. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Don't go away. I'm getting some more paperwork. Okay. Next on the agenda is further discussions and approval of the vehicle that's proposed to be donated for EMA. <coughs> As most of you know, we went through this exercise last month. I came before the county board and did some lengthy, I'm not sure what I would characterize it, but some lengthy activity why we ultimately decided to bring it back here. So here we are. I've asked Mr. Stacey to put together a list of benefits and so forth from for this vehicle. And I believe that's what he's passing out now. It, it is not. I will get you that list. What I passed out is actually a draft uh, memorandum of understanding. Uh, it's been discussed, the potential MOU with the Airport County Public Health Department, uh, and it's been recommended to me by the state's attorney that the full county board uh, approve that, that as EMA director, I do not sign that. So that is why it's before you. But before we get into that, I will review with you uh, also what I passed out um, is a sample policy from Vermillion County, and I will go into that in a month, minute. So, uh, one, I apologize for not being at the full board meeting. I was at a mandatory conference, um, training conference in Bloomington. So, apologize, but it was unavoidable. 
Uh, there's been some questions about uh, the policy that would need to apply to the usage of an EMA vehicle, regardless of what vehicle or where it came from. I recommend using the county vehicle policy. Uh, I've been reviewing what other counties have specific to EMA vehicle policies, and I called maybe six other EMAs regionally, and none of them had a specific policy for EMA vehicles. Lots of counties have a vehicle policy, and by and large, they go along with the standard good things such as you know, drinking and driving, only approved employees, and the county will keep a hold of, uh, will keep track of their license and their insurance, so on and so forth. Um, any other drivers need to be previously authorized, so on and so forth. What I pass out to you is Vermillion's, which they did provide me. Um, I also called Champaign County, didn't have any paperwork. Um, they're underneath the general county and sheriff's department policy. Their EMA is underneath the sheriff's department. Uh, Woodford, underneath the county policy. Uh, DeWitt County, underneath the general county vehicle policy. And they have two vehicles, so nothing special there. Um, let's see, who else did I call? Logan County didn't have a specific policy. Uh, somebody else, but I can't remember at this point in time. So I recommend going with the county, the existing county vehicle policy, and then uh, perhaps stipulating that um, previously, so starting at this meeting, if the EMA coordinator should be taking that home vehicle home every day, or if they should not. Um, there are a lot of EMA coordinators that take coordinators that take the county vehicle home every day, and there are some that don't. And that was a question that was asked at a full board meeting, so I recommend uh, discussing that. I'm open to suggestion. Also, uh, whom can drive it? It was also pointed out at the full board meeting that the EMA coordinator is not the only one that would need to use an EMA vehicle. I have 11 volunteers, uh, some more active than others, but I had to utilize them during this last disaster to do damage assessment, and they had to use their own personal vehicles. Uh, they were not reimbursed for the gasoline or their time. Uh, they just utilized their personal vehicles, and that was that. However, if they were to drive an official county vehicle, it would be a lot better for them. It would uh, decrease our liability questions, and uh, it would also give them legitimacy when they're working on the field, regardless of whether it's me or an EMA volunteer. Uses. Um, there are some questions about how an EMA vehicle would be used. First of all, let me go into response. Here are some examples of how EMA has used a 4x4 tow-capable high-sitting vehicle in the past four years. In June 2014, straight-line winds caused power line tree and roof damage to Clifton and Crescent City. Uh, in responding to the event, I used my personal F-150 to reach the local fire stations to coordinate with the incident commanders. Debris was strewn across all local roads, but direct communication with the incident commanders was necessary to ensure coordination. There's trees and down power lines everywhere, but I had to get to the fire station. Especially since I was new at that point, I didn't know who these uh, fire chiefs were, had to get to them, and because I had a high city and 404 vehicle, I was able to do that without a problem. Uh, flood damage assessment. Keeping in mind that uh, I've worked three major floods now, July 2015, New Year from 15 to 16, and this recent one, February 2018. During a flooding event, EMA needs to perform rapid needs assessment, uh, which is to ascertain any unmet needs or gaps in flooded areas. In rural areas along Sugar Creek, Airport River, and Spring Creek, this is exceptionally difficult. Uh, roads flood, then recede and flood again, especially immediately following a rain, um, which, can be, which can be dangerous. Uh, during those floods, I sent out volunteers or myself um, to do that rapid needs assessment. And there are certain areas which we can't access. There are roads that have water on it that you should not drive on. And we educate on that. However, there are some passable roads. So having a 4x4 high sitting vehicle is necessary for that and has proved to be so. These areas are not regularly patrolled, so 
that is one of the reasons why we go there, because there's a gap. I did not know what was going on in um, La Rock or the Beaver Creek area or Timberloin. So we sent volunteers out there to figure out if they need help or not. Immediately after water is received, EMA needs to perform a more detailed damage assessment. Where we go and we talk to home residents, figure out exactly what happened to their home, how deep it was, what kind of damage they sustained. But we need to do this immediately once the waters go down, once the homeowners get back into their home, because we have to have that information within so many days. Uh, it is often uh, difficult to access some of these areas because when flood waters come in, it brings a lot of mud and muck, and sometimes four by three or four vehicles prove necessary just to get to these roads. Also, there's often debris that has been left by flooded water on the roads. So, not to mention the roads themselves might be damaged. That has been very helpful. Moving on past floods, uh, throughout numerous snow and, our, snow and ice storms, I've used my personal F-150 to ensure access not only to the EOC, but also to get to any municipality or um, unincorporated uh, populous area that has lost power. Um, sometimes we need to do a quick assessment there just to make sure that everybody has what they need. If we have a large population in the middle of winter during a storm that does not have electricity, folks, we have a lot of medically dependent people uh, throughout the United States and in Iroquois County, and they have medical devices that are necessary that need to be plugged in. So, I often need that uh, just to get to those municipalities to make sure that they are okay. Uh, asset mobilization. A tow capable vehicle is required to move needed assets, such as the American Red Cross shelter trailer, currently is sitting over at Trinity Church. Throughout the numerous floods, uh, we've had to set up shelters. Uh, we've needed to move that trailer. I have never been able to do that. Uh, my volunteer, a couple of my volunteers have vehicles that are able to do that. So they've done it. However, it put increases liability questions, so on and so forth. If EMA had their own tow, tow capable vehicle to do that, that's simple. Uh, mobile genera generators sitting in regional caches. Uh, as is crudely mentioned, there are numerous uh, mutual aid organizations, whether it be uh, ILEAS, um, Mavis, IPLAMAN, Mutual Aid for Public Works, or uh, IESMA, Mutual Aid for Emergency Managers. Lots of these have regional caches of mobile generators. Hook them up uh, like you would a trailer, you can go down the road. Uh, this is exceptionally helpful. While we have not utilized this uh, during my time, I know it was very necessary during the Tornado Gifford. They kept the nursing home from evacuating that way um, by just moving a generator with Champaign County EMA vehicle. Communications trailers. Sitting outside, it's not a county asset, is a smokehouse trailer. However, it is also a backup communications trailer. With the tow capable vehicle, EMA could tow that to wherever it was needed should we need that backup communications. Supply trailers. Uh, there are numerous supply trailers by different organizations throughout the state and here in Iroquois County. Public Health Department hosts a trailer outside owned by the Champaign Regional Healthcare Coalition that is a point of dispensing supply trailer. Uh, and to tow that wherever we need it, which is the purpose, to set up a point of dispensing for medications or medical supplies throughout the Iroquois County if we were need to that, if we were need to do that, is necessary. Mobile command trailers. I mentioned IESMA, the Mutual Aid Organization for Emergency Managers. IESMA owns a number of mobile command trailers or EOC command trailers throughout the state of Illinois. Those are available to us should we need them. Uh, but we may need to go pick them up. You can't do that. Uh, so those are some examples of why a tow capable vehicle has been necessary. Uh, supply hauling. In the past, I've used my personal truck uh, to haul tables and chairs during a disaster to set up a, a multi-agency resource center, to haul personal protective equipment to people that were helping cleaning out uh, flooded homes, water, people that did not have access to drinking water, cots to make sure that emergency responders and uh, disaster victims could have a place to lay their head, 
and other necessary supplies to victims and emergency responders during the disaster response. These are examples of response, uh, the category of response, why an EMA vehicle is necessary. Public events. The use of an official EMA vehicle for public events gives legitimacy to the agency and Iroquois County. It also provides a sense of security and pride to the citizens. Examples include Iroquois County Fair, various parades, and other public meetings that EMA hosts. Taking an official EMA vehicle to regional meetings outside of Iroquois County also lends to our legitimacy, capability to provide mutual aid, which we have received numerous times, and simplifies liability in a vehicle accident. So, in large, this is what I've uh, come up with to try to address a lot of the questions that will come up in the full county board meeting. I am available to answer any other questions. Anybody have questions for Eric? So, as far as the vehicle policy you're recommending, just put it under what already exists? Yes. And you said you'd like us to discuss whether it goes home with you or not. I guess, from my understanding, if it goes home with you, then it becomes a benefit that would have to be taxed. So I would say that would have to be, I mean, is it that beneficial for you to take it home with you every night? To have to go through the taxing of it and everything else? The question is, is it beneficial to the agency? Uh, I am responsible for getting myself to work every day and getting myself home. So that is not the question. The question is whether or not you want me to be able to respond immediately with a county vehicle from my home. I am a 24-7 employee. I need to be able to respond to something that happens at 2 in the morning on Sunday. So the question is whether you want me to be able to respond immediately. Now, I am not an emergency responder. I am not a law enforcement. I am not fire department. I do not need to pull people out of fires. I do not need to stop criminal. So I don't need a vehicle as much as a cop or a fire department at my home. There are numerous other EMAs that do take a county vehicle home. So, just like you guys be able to cite that. I think it is viable to leave the vehicle here. Um, well, it works out personally because I only live in Crescent City, and US 24 is typically taken care of pretty darn well in between Crescent City and Watsika. That may not always be the case, but leaving the county vehicle here at the county facilities does also make sense. Um, as I mentioned before, I may not be the only one using it. So my EMA volunteers need to be able to use it. So, if it stays there, as opposed to just stays with me, that also makes sense. I guess my opinion would be that normally it would stay here, wherever here happens to be, unless there is a situation where you know you will be needing it, you know, like during flooding, then it would make sense for you to have it home. If there was an event that you know, you know, if there's bad weather or whatever, where it makes sense, then, you know, so I guess there, as a, as a standard, it would stay here, but with the discussion of if it's necessary for an event, then you would take it home. That makes perfect sense to me. I questioned spending a lot of time on a policy if we don't get the vehicle in the end. Do we need to have a policy in place in case we're going to be given an army tank? Let's, let's decide whether we're going to get the vehicle and then develop a policy. Well, what some of them brought up was lack of a policy. They, they, they wanted a policy as to how it was going to be used before they would vote for it. Yeah, I, I realize that, and that person was, I'm sure, not willing to work on a policy. They just wanted one. Well, one of them 
that did mention it, you know, I think if there was a policy in place, would probably be okay with it. So. Probably already has a policy in place. Why do we need to have a policy? Well, if, if there's one in place, we just have to state that this vehicle falls under that policy. Your vehicles fall under the county policy, Joel? That allows you to take your vehicle home? But that's the only one. And the sheriff, you're, you're doing the same? The sheriff's. Uh, use of vehicle policies is within the sheriff's office policy and procedure. It's so not, that's separate apart from. It's separate and apart from the county. Yes. Okay. Is the coroner's covered by the county policy? I don't know if he's got his own or not. I mean, I know thinking back, the last three coroners prior to him all had vehicles that they took home. So. If he doesn't have its own, it would have to fall under the county policy. Okay, well, I, I don't know how many of us are totally familiar with the county policy right off the top of our head here, so that may be a bit of a handicap. But uh, nevertheless, if, that's, if that policy is suitable and satisfactory, I don't see why there's, we should have any issues or problems with it. Uh, if I may, Bills? you know, the question of needs and how the vehicle is used, I feel, has gone to extreme because I feel the real underlying problem here is when the donor was so-called recognized and there's been some other entities that have dealt with him and one in particular recently that they felt that the strings turned out to be not what they wanted to have later by taking a, a donation from this particular thing. So, and that initially one, this come asked 30 days ago, nobody asked who the donor was. You said it was somebody donate something, but I could tell quite obvious by the median what was going on last month at our full board meeting that the strings that come before. So the only question I have, Eric, would be, do you have any strings tied to this vehicle with this donor? There is one stipulation for the donation of this vehicle. It is used for EMA purposes. And that's it. That is the stipulation. And that's all I need to hear. Ditto. Do you have anything, Lyle? I no. And if I may comment on why this particular vehicle is quite advantageous, um, which I tried to do last month at policy procedure, but if you'll allow me to revisit that. Um, this vehicle, for its age, is in excellent condition. Let me get you to keep them paid for. Thank you. Um, The uh, $800 that I estimated, that is the increased cost that I expect next fiscal year. I am not asking for an increase this fiscal year. This vehicle is 4x4, tow capable, sits higher than a normal vehicle, will allow access to some areas that are inaccessible to smaller vehicles. It is already equipped with numerous light bars, uh, radio uh, cable lining, not the radios themselves, however, we're working on getting those available. Um, we already have a VHF that we can plug in, which is the main radio that we need. That's what all county emergency frequencies are on. Uh, it has a strobe light, it has a spotlight, it helps to see, obviously in dark areas. Um, PA system and siren. So this vehicle is already equipped, minus the radios. So I already have a VHF radio to, to put into it, and that's going to get me on the road immediately. 
once it's installed. I think we've gone over this thing long enough. Is there a motion on this matter? I'll move that we accept this donation that uh, Eric has brought to us based off of the no strings. One string. Yeah. Yes, for one purpose only. <laughs> Not that it can only be used for EMA only, but that right. is for EMA. And purposes. you might share it with another EMA district. You might share it with the sheriff's it's department. Mutual way. It is in the nature of my position to help out other agencies. You share everything you have in your department. I own nothing. Russell, do you want to include in your motion something about the use of the vehicle falling under the county's policy? Not necessarily, because I think this is all getting to be a little bit too far. Next thing you know, you want to know the color of the paint, the stripes, and I don't want to get involved with that. But we have department managers that we have confidence in, no matter we're talking about the coroner or sheriff or, or our highway department guy that deals with this type of issue all day, and we don't tell him what color of vehicle he needs or what kind of cheer to have in or what radio station to listen to. I mean, it's just on and on. So, I, I agree. That's why I asked about the other departments, because we don't tell them what to do. Sorry, I'm we're not sure. Our, our, we're not in the business of micromanaging our department heads. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to approve the accepting this donation. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Barron seconds the motion. Is there any further questions or comments on this? Seeing none, would you call the roll, please? Uh, sure. Barron's? Yes. Bills? Yes. Signa? Yes. And sure. Yes. Now, okay. Can I, motion passed. Can I ask that somebody send out the county vehicle policy to all the board members so that they will have that, and then if they complain that they don't know what it is, they'll have it, or they have had it sent to them? Well, I think it was okay. pointed out here, we'll, we'll approve the donation of the vehicle at first, and then we'll determine the use of it or what the policy that will fall under. So that well, likely will come to this committee next month. I would think that just by virtue of it being a county vehicle, it falls under existing policy. So just to make sure that all the board members know what that policy is, if we send it out, it may save some argument. There's no harm in, in putting it out at the next board meeting. That's a good point. There's always somebody trying to pick something apart for, if yeah, they've got for whatever policy. reason, but you know, if it's... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next on the agenda is update on flood matters in Iroquois County. At the last meeting, I think I mentioned that I was going to be going to a meeting over in Rensselaer, Indiana on the 14th of June. I did that. State Representative Bennett and his legislative assistant, Angel Crawford, accompanied me on that. There were, we initially thought there were going to be about three people plus an attorney at the meeting. It turned out there were about 12 people. The meeting was held at the Klaus Cafe in Rensselaer in the back room. And uh, being that there were so many people there, it was it was a little bit difficult to get everything completely organized. But essentially, the tenor of the meeting was to tell us what what the plans and activities of their over in, in Indiana regarding the Iroquois River, uh, plans to clean the river out, plans to do some things to. Uh, reinforce some of the banks in, in areas where there's been been uh, the banks caving in, that kind of thing. We were told that on July 12th there's going to be a meeting, or excuse me, July 11th there's going to be a meeting at the Kankakee River Basin Commission in North Judson, Indiana, where there will be some decisions made about activities along the Iroquois River. Essentially, they, the meeting was for the purpose of letting us know what's going on in Indiana and try and find out what might be going on in Iroquois County and to encourage us to make some improvements along the river here. 
So it was primarily a meeting to get acquainted with the people over there and to gather some information and some facts about what's going on. The next day after the meeting on Friday the 15th, I got an email from Andy Wheeler, the board chairman in Kankakee County. He wanted wanting to meet with me regarding activities on the Kankakee River. So on June 20th, which is a Wednesday, I attended a meeting with him and Angel Crawford Representative Bennett's legislative assistant accompanied me and we found out again there's quite a bit of activity going on over in Indiana. The Kankakee River, which is Mr. Wheeler's main concern, as many of you may know, that river goes all the way up to its origins north of South Bend. There's also another river called the Yellow River that, that is a tributary of the Kankakee River over in Indiana. And the Yellow River runs through some areas that's got some very, very sandy soil in it, which has been primarily the culprit in sand being uh, transported down the Kankakee River. It's, it's in the city of Kankakee right now, clogging up the river at some of the dams and so forth. So Mr. Wheeler is very concerned about that. He's also interested in getting Iroquois County to participate in any kind of activity that may come out of all this. Um, again, he, he's aware of this meeting on July 11th, and uh, it's something that uh, we probably will be attending also. Part of the problem that I've learned about this is that First of all, the river basins that were involved here encompass a huge amount of territory. You could really go to the Mississippi River and come back following the Illinois River and you would get into an area around the South Peru where Senator Sue Resin is and she's formed an alliance of all the communities in her district, which includes the Kankakee River, as far east as somewhere around Braidwood. It includes the, uh, part of the Fox River and then the, all of the Illinois River and the LaSalle, Peru, and Ottawa area. As, as some of you may know, there's rivers up in Wisconsin that water comes into Illinois along with what we have in Indiana. It's a huge area. It's a huge situation. One of the things that I learned is that the rivers in Indiana are governed and controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers out of Detroit. The Kankakee River in Kankakee County is controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers out of Chicago. The Iroquois River in Iroquois County is controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers out of Rock Island. If you know anything about government, you can see some of the po possible problems that exist in this situation. <clears throat> Further to that, we're learning, as I said, about the plans that the people in Indiana have about trying to take action on the rivers there, and they're wanting to get a study done by an outfit called Burke Engineering out of Indianapolis. You'll see in a few minutes when I pass out the correspondence, there's an individual that has contacted me complaining about the, um, shall we say, the activities of Burke Engineering. So I'm not sure exactly how much that will complicate matters, but what I'm trying to point out, we're in the, in the initial stages of this. I want to keep everybody informed and up to date of what's going on. Um, today at 10 o'clock this morning, uh, Representative Bennett is having a teleconference that I'm supposed to participate in with a number of parties all across the state and I guess even into Indiana. And that's a precursor to a meeting on July 12th in Forest, where there'll be speakers coming from uh, the Illinois Water Commission, Champaign Regional Planning Commission, Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, I don't know, quite a few people will be coming to that meeting. Joel Moore's been invited to it, I believe. I have Bob Yergler's invited to the meeting. Eric Sacy's been invited to the meeting. I'm hoping that all of us will have an opportunity to go and to get more information about what's going on. I think it's a situation where we have to recognize, number one, that floods are something that nobody can prevent. 
Uh, floods are a fact of life. If you don't like floods, you shouldn't live in an area where there might be one. That's the plain and simple truth of it. But nevertheless, we have many situations where floods do cause problems. And one of the things I think is the effort of this is to try to minimize the impact of floods as much as possible going forward. I think we've all experienced too many problems and too much economic loss because of the floods that we've had. I think most, most officials are at the point where we want to get something done. Exactly what that's going to be, it's too, way too early to say, but again, I want everybody to know what's going on and, and uh, so forth. So there will be obviously more information coming forth in the near future. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. If anybody has any questions, i try to answer them. Sounds like a little premature for me to make any comment. It, it is for pretty much everything, but I mean, it's it's something that, you know, I, I think Iroquois County, for example, has experienced enough economic loss and hardships over the floods that we've had. I think it's time to try and get something done to minimize that. But we do need to recognize that we can't stop flooding from occurring. We had flooding just last week. Uh, as Derek pointed out, we had Spring Creek over by Onarga where the creek was out of its banks. There was some farmland that lost some crops and damage that way. That's an economic loss. And, and every, time you, every time you have any waterway go someplace it's not supposed to go, you're going to hurt somebody or cause some kind of problem. Well, again, when you talk flood, you got different terminology. Bob's very familiar with them. I'm sure a lot of other people are, because you're talking areas in what we call flood way. Uh, then, when you the next step of it, when the water gets higher, you go into flood plain. Now, and then when you start getting into your different levels of your flood plain, that's where we really got to be watching, because we're not going to stop water getting in flood way. No, because that's there for a reason. And, I can give and, you a, I can and here's the thing I want to just go into this comment about what the folks over in Indiana are doing. Because one thing they're doing, like anybody that has uh, sets on a drainage district, you want to improve your drainage in that area. And that's 99% of all these projects about one thing, improving their drainage. And as long as they continue to improve their drainage like they have over the last 150 years, we're going to get more water on the downstream side. So everybody, I don't care where you're sitting on the Illinois River or the Kinky River or what, after it leaves here, there's going to be more problems. Well, and that's part of what needs to come out of all this. And it's my understanding that nobody can do anything as far as modifying any, any waterway without the approval of the Army Corps of Engineers. They so have the final say so. It's, it's kind of strange about this area because this area versus like the western part of the country, uh, everybody around here is trying to get rid of the water all the time. Where you go to the western part of the country, they fight over every ounce of water they can because they don't have enough water. But And the bottom line, the water is money. It makes people money. One of the things that may come out of some of this too, there have been several people higher ups in Illinois that have voiced dis their disapproval to me of our base flood ordinance. And uh, they may be exerting a lot of pressure on us to try and change that. We'll deal with that when it, when it happens, but I just let you know about that too. So. We have the federal government want to adopt it. Yeah. So that's, that's the update on the floods. Uh, like I said, unless somebody has any questions or whatever, that's, that's kind of where we're at. So we'll continue to stay on top of it and move forward, and hopefully we can get some benefit for Iroquois County out of this. Okay, moving on. Appointments. Uh, I don't know of any unusual or out of the ordinary appointments this month, so we'll go on to correspondence. Got, what you've got there, Russell, is on and off. Same thing we had before about that landfill up by Donovan. I don't know why we keep getting this. 
things. It's well, I think we just got the last one, but yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. Time a permit goes to EPA and Northwood County, we're going to hear about it. Right, it, there's no action required on that right. part. This is a letter from ABRA expressing their appreciation for the. What we did, it says they bought a couple fire fire blankets and a tire for one of their vehicles. And they got an editorial in there about not getting enough money from the state, which is a problem we all have. Too much about that. Here's Illinois Extension. I think they got some money out of my radio. This is the letter I told you about about Burke Engineering. Oh yeah, I got that. You know about that. Oh huh? yeah. <laughs> I read that in detail. In contact with some people over there. I have no idea, you know, whether what this guy's complaining about if that's valid or not. I don't have, know the history of this outfit, but it's yeah, certainly yeah. something that it's a red flag that needs to be looked at, I guess. So. End of session update from UCCI.